Thank you for uh, handing it over, Paige, and for providing um, that background information. Uh, so welcome everyone today. Uh, today we are honored to have uh, three of the Natural History Study uh, principal investigators, Dr. Ellen Percy, Dr. Eric Marsh, and Dr. Jeff Newell uh, join us today. And really the goals of today are to discuss the Natural History Study, what it has uh, accomplished, and um, where we will be going um, at the conclusion of the natural history study. Um, so this will be a great opportunity to hear directly from those um, who have been involved um, for years and years, and are also um, guiding us in the development of the next phase. And so I will um, ask each of you to briefly introduce yourself and talk about your connection to the natural history study. Um, so Dr. Percy, if you could please begin. Hi, I'm Alan Percy. I'm the principal investigator of the natural history study. I started uh, this with Art Baudet back in 2003, uh, then continued as the PI in 2009, and uh, welcomed uh, these two other gentlemen uh, at that time. So happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Newell, if you could please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, Jeff Newell. I'm a child neurologist. I'm at Vanderbilt, and um, I've been involved uh, with the natural history study since about 2003. But I did not have white in my beard when we start when I started working on this. Um, Alan inspired me to get the white, um, <laughs> and uh, I've been functioning as the administrative head of it since uh, 2014 with Alan as a PI. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Newell. I do remember the younger days pre-white when I would see you at the travel uh, natural history visits in Chicago. So I can attest to the fact that it wasn't always white. All right, and now Dr. Marsh, if you could please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, my name is Eric Marsh. I'm at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I run our right clinic here on our neurogenics program and I have been uh, the leader of the evoked potential biomarker, um, e.g. invoked potential biomarker component of the study for the last five years and had the pleasure to work with these guys and had our local site for the natural history study as well. Great, thank you. And I do wanna say, well, I have three of um, the clinical researchers that are heavily involved in the natural history study. This obviously does not represent all of the sites. There are many more sites um, that have been involved. Um, just these three leaders will um, walk us through some of the great work that's been done. So I'm gonna start off by asking um, you a question, Dr. Percy. Can you tell me, when did the natural history start and how many people have enrolled in the study since then? So we actually began funding the study in 2003 from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Um, however, because it took a little while to have the forms activated, we didn't actually enroll anyone in two, until 2006. Uh, during the first... Uh, two iterations of this uh, study. Typically with a grant to the NIH, you have to renew every five years. So with the first two uh, iterations of the grant, this was a study that uh, involved both Rett syndrome, Angelman syndrome, and uh, Prader-Willi syndrome. The requirement uh, was that uh, the uh, these rare disease proposals should include three different disorders. That's why those three existed. We began enrolling individuals in 2006, and through the first two uh, iterations, uh, we enrolled 1,220 individuals. 955 of those had classic RET, 166 had atypical RET syndrome, and 99 had uh, mutations in MECP2, but did not have Rett syndrome. And this included 35 individuals who had MECP2 duplications. Uh, in 2014, the, uh, we, begin, we resubmitted and began in 2015 to enroll individuals in RDCRN3. Um, and at that time, 
we uh, were involved only with individuals with uh, Rett syndrome or Rett syndrome related disorders. So this included Rett syndrome, MECD2 duplication, CDKL, CDKL5, and FOXG1. And since, uh, and over the last six years now with that, we have enrolled uh, uh, a good deal more, uh, 10, 000, uh, 1,023, uh, 653 of these have a, a typical RET, uh, 89 have atypical RET, uh, 73 have MECP2 duplication, 61 have uh, MECP2 mutations but do not have RET syndrome, 72 have CDKL5, 66 have FOXG1, and there are six individuals who had or met criteria for Rett syndrome but who actually had mutations in other genes. So I think, and there is some overlap uh, between uh, one and two and three, so it's, it's don't just add the 1,222 and the 1,023, it's closer to 1,650 or 1,700 total individuals. Great. Yeah, and thanks for kind of explaining how this study changed over the years. So the natural history study is something that's funded by the National, to National Institutes of Health. Um, and as Dr. Percy mentioned, it required reapplying for a grant every uh, five years. Um, and it's through the Rare Disease Consortium Research Network. And as Dr. Percy mentioned, you had to have a consortium of three disorders. And so initially there were Angelman syndrome, Prader-Willi syndrome, and Rett syndrome. But then in this last cycle, it became just the Rett and Rett-related uh, disorders where it was, um, as Dr. Percy mentioned, those disorders that are uh, related to Rett syndrome phenotypically as well as MFP2 related. So that covers also, you know, which populations have been involved through the years. Um, so Eric, can you talk a little bit about, in addition to um, just the fact that these different populations were seen, to understand the natural history study of these different disorders, what other studies were conducted at the same time? And in particular, you can focus on um, your biomarker work. Yeah, so, you know, as, as you say, there's been a few other parts of the study that have gone on. Um, there's two biomarking components. One is an electrophysiologic one using EEG and what we call evoke potentials. Another, I think Jeff can talk more about, which is the serum and blood-based biomarker study. And there was also this uh, a, a questionnaire, the RET-B study, which I guess you guys could all talk more about than I could uh, can as well. Um, so the you know the many people believe that EEG and evoke potentials and electrophysiologic markers can be good measures of severity or response to treatment in, in um, disorders neurologic disorders and to test that this uh, the evoke potential study have was put in place and this was only a subset of the sites only five of the sites participated in this because you needed specialized um, equipment and people who could uh, perform this work and um, and so it, it reduced the number of people who uh, were involved and we've enrolled over um, 80 people in this across the different disorders the most again being within uh, Rett syndrome and we've gotten some interesting results, which actually, as of last Friday, was officially accepted into the adults neurology. Um, I can uh, show real briefly to show you all kind of what this we're talking about here. Oops. Um, gotta... Eric, while you're looking that up, is an yeah. evoked potential the same thing as an EEG that you would get? So that's a um, very good question. So EEG right is you've all had your children have likely had an EEG or most likely have had an EEG and this is a technique that we put electrodes on the head really easy for me without any hair there um, 
and that it then records brain waves. So these the electrodes are little microphones that pick up the sounds of the brain and records brain waves. And so if one's having a seizure, you can see particular patterns of activity that emerge during uh, that seizure. Um, so you can record brain waves when a child is just resting or an adult is just resting. You can also give a stimuli and see how the brain responds to that stimuli. So it's the same technique of just recording brain waves, but in an evoked potential, you provide a, a stimulus to the person in order to see how the brain responds. So for the study that we did, we did um, just 20 minutes where the child was just resting, which we call resting state, EEG. And then we did two um, stimuli presentation. One was a sound that was just a kind of a white noise sound that occurred kind of randomly for about five minutes. And the other was a flashing light. It was actually a checkerboard screen of black and white squares that switched. So it kind of gave it a perception of, of a flashing type of light. And with that, where's my share screen thing? Um, where is it? No, that's not it. I've done this before. You think a year into this, I will have figured this out, but. Um, All the different platforms. Yeah, where's the share screen? It's. Uh, yeah, if you go the view, the view in full screen mode, that last button on the panel. Viewing full screen mode. All right, Paige, can you? Yep, I sent the invitation to you, Dr. Marsh, to share your screen. Oh, stop sharing my webcam. Does that allow it? I still don't see it. Um, I, I did email you, uh, Dr. Bouchard, the slides just a second ago. If you can pull them up, or we could just pass on this too if it's taking too much time. You know, while we're looking for it, if we could ask uh, Dr. Newell to talk about um, the serum biomarker work that was done through the natural history study. Sure. So um, back in 2010 or so, um, I started doing a biobanking procedure that um, was not was not funded by the NIH, it was not directly part of the, oh wait, I'll let Eric. Right. It just, it popped up right then. But you can, you want to finish talking, Jeff, then I can go back to this, or I'll just go. All right, so the, this here is an example of an evoked potential response. The red is a typically developing a child and the blue is a child with Rett syndrome and you see the response the stimulus is presented at this black line this vertical black line and you see the brain has a very um, consistent response in neurotypical individuals and individuals with Rett syndrome and this is a, a population average of 41 children with Rett and 24 children um, who are typically developing and aged matched and you see there's a, a difference, and we can quantify those differences here, looking at this first peak, or the second peak, or the third peak, or the differences between the peaks. And we can see that there are differences. Now, that I'm only showing a little bit of the data here. Um, we can look at both the time to the peak and also the, the amplitude of the peak. And interestingly, when you look at the time, which is latency to the peak, there are no differences. But when we look at the amplitude of the peak, there are very large differences. And one of the, you know, this study was kind of a first of its type for all different um, developmental disorders in that it was the first multi-center study where uh, this, you know, a lot of this type of work has been done before, but at an individual location. So like at Vanderbilt with Dr. Newell and his colleagues, they've done some Rhett evoked potential studies before, um, Dr. Peters uh, there. Um, at Albert Einstein in the Bronx, they've done some evoked potential studies and at Boston Children's, all at single sites. One of the issues that gets raised when you go across sites is, is there consistency? So in this study, we were able to show really good consistency across sites. And the other thing that we've done here is we're following people over time. So we have now some 
uh, individuals who have recorded over three years of time. And here is just showing you that the responses, whether visual or auditory, are very consistent. These are just four of the 40-something patients as an example, but you can see that the waveforms for the black is year one, the blue is um, the second year, are almost identical in these four example patients. And these are four different patients with auditory responses here. And you again see really very tight correlation. And we see very good correlation between the first year and the second year uh, waveforms. So, you know, we can show that this is a type of test that can be done across multiple different sites and be done reproducibly from year to year. And those are two very good um, features of a potential um, clinical measure that could be used to tell us something about whether the severity or, or the, um, how a child would respond to a drug. And the other thing we looked at was the severity um, of the subject, of the child, compared to some of these different features. And as I think we'll talk a little bit more uh, in a bit, uh, Drs. Percy and Newell will say that we have a couple measures, the clinical severity scale and the RET motor behavioral assessment, and that we were able to show that the, and these are a scatter plot with the amplitude on this axis and the severity score on the x-axis, and we were able to show that there was a clear correlation between the higher, the larger your amplitude of your response, the lower your score or the less severe of your score. And that within, with an increase or decreasing amplitude of the response, there was about a half a point change on the severity score. So, you know, this is very encouraging that the brain wave marker in response to both um, visual or auditory stimuli can tell us something about what's going on um, in the brain. And that is, you know, the next step in this would be to follow someone long-term to see if their score changes, how well this uh, predicts their score change in advance, and then to use this in upcoming trials to see if it can tell us who would respond or who would not respond to a medication. So this is the type of work that the natural history study has allowed us to do um, that we wouldn't have been able to do without um, this on study going on. And thanks to all of the families who were participated and sat through the couple two hour process that it took to get through this whole thing. So um, I will stop sharing my screen. Eric, thanks for, for sharing that data. Congratulations on uh, getting this, this work submitted. And that's exciting to hear that through this longitudinal study, you've been able to identify a potential biomarker that you've also correlated with the clinical severity scale and the motor behavioral assessment. And really, it's through a study that allows you to collect all of that data so that you can bring that data together for any one given patient, but also across the population. Um, and I think one of the benefits of the natural history study, the way that it has been designed, is that you have patients, you have study participants across the severity spectrum, but also across the age spectrum. Um, and I think that's something that you're able to um, learn as well. Does it change with time? And um, for example, well, the evoked potentials, you correlated it with that severity. Um, but then you also mentioned that longitudinally, you could see over time to someone's um, do, does the um, evoked potential change, where you showed it stayed, it stayed stable across two different time points. Uh, but as someone ages, how does that change? Yeah, so, you know, we, because, you know, ideally you'd want to follow people for a long period of time, um, we didn't have many patients whose scores changed significantly over time for us to be able to um, answer that question of would there be a change with time. There was a few patients whose scores did change a little bit, and actually the, the evoked potential measure did not change which raises an interesting question of, you know, this little change in the CSS or the MBA, 
was the child having a bad day? And so the, the physician rater gave it, gave them a bad score, but their brainwaves was telling us actually there's been no change in that child. And you know, what would be a better readout of this on a, you know, to take away the variability of, you know, the child didn't really want to go with you to clinic that day and didn't want to meet um, Dr. Newell that day. And so, you know, <laughs> so that uh, you know, made them really just sit there and not participate and not communicate as well as they normally could. But the brainwaves were able to tell us that, oh no, actually they're doing just as well. So that's the type of thing that, you know, the advantage of a quantitative marker like this is that it gets around a lot of the, potentially gets around a lot of the variability that exists in the day-to-day -day in patients. So we still have a lot more work to do and we hope to be doing that as we move forward. That's great to have something potentially more objective um, to measure. Uh, Dr. Newell, since you were just uh, thrown under the bus as being the bad guy uh, <laughs> that patients don't want to come in for, can you tell us a little bit? They're always happy. It's always, every time. It's amazing. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the serum biomarker that Dr. Marsh had uh, briefly mentioned? Sure. So uh, before my my computer system died and I lost contact with you all, um, I was starting to say that in uh, about 2011, 2010, 2011, I started doing a bio, doing biobanking, collecting blood um, from people who had been enrolled in the Natural History Society, but it was actually not part of the Natural History Society. So we were able to use the data. Um, and then in 2014, we made it formally part of the, the study. So in that four years, I'd collected about 230 uh, samples from people with uh, Rett syndrome. And we used that to do a couple things. We sequenced people who clinically had Rett syndrome but didn't have mutations in MECP2. And we found mutations in other genes that are associated with other neurodevelopmental diseases. So showing that there's some overlap clinically probably between these disorders. The other thing um, that we did was uh, do looked at the um, the what's called the metabolites. So these are small chemical compounds that are broken down um, during cellular processes, during eating, other cellular processes. Um, and we compared people who had Rett syndrome with their unaffected siblings, and we found that there were different patterns of these metabolites between the two. And we're currently we've analyzed. Um, uh, these metabolites also to look at how they relate to clinical severity. So and we have very, we have some results. We haven't published those yet, but we're getting ready to publish them that show that they do. Um, there is some metabolites that look different between people with Rett syndrome who are more severe than the people who are less severe. Um, so now, cur currently though, we've in the in the current natural history study, we've collected another 200. Well, we've collected about 280 samples total from people who have who are enrolled in the Natural History Society and also their family, a number of them have family members. And I greatly appreciate everybody who's participated in both parts, all parts of this. And that provides us with the resource to um, do a couple different things. One is to do um, those metabolites that we found before. Now we have a new set of samples so we can confirm whether that is true. So that's part of a whole process. When you find something in one set of samples, you'd like to go back and confirm it in a different set to make sure that that is consistent, that it wasn't just a random thing that happened in the first time. So that allows us to do that uh, reanalysis. The second thing, which was one of the original reasons why I started doing the biobanking back in 2010, was to try to be able to do um, genetic analysis to find what we would call genetic modifiers. So we have, you know, we know that, you know, there's all there's people who have Rett syndrome and they have a variety of clinical features and we can say, yes, they have Rett syndrome, but we can look at two different individuals and say there's differences in how severely they're affected in terms of how they walk or talk or use their hands. We know there are things that contribute to this, like different genetic mutations in MECP2. Some mutations seem to be more oftentimes associated with more severe clinical features and other mutations. But that is not always true. We can't say that for the individual. We can take, we can find individuals who have very, what we call a severe mutation, but they're not very severely affected and vice versa. We can say, here's a person who has a mild mutation, but they personally are very severe. 
And so there are other, what we'd say, biological factors that contribute to that variation in the clinical features of severity. And so what we'd like to do is try to find, one of the ideas is that there may be other genetic changes, not things that cause disease, but just changes in, other, in the genes that seem to make somebody maybe more severe or less severe. And so we'd like to try to find those kind of things because that there's a couple things reasons for that. One is that it would provide um, insights into what is the underlying biology. If you find these you know genes that are in different pathways, we say, oh, that might be part of why mutations in MECP2 cause Rett syndrome, like a pathway, a biological pathway. The other is that those biological pathways may be things that you could target with drugs. So there may be Drug, you know, there may be things that are better to be targeted with drugs. Different proteins and parts of biological pathways are more easy to target with drugs than other things. MECP2 is not actually an easy thing to target. Other things that are involved in how the cell signals within itself are easy to, easier to target with drugs. And there's lots of drugs that target different things. And so that might provide an opportunity for a different way to approach therapy. So previously I had sequenced a group of people who were either very, very severe or very mild, and we found a variety of genetic changes that were enriched in one group or the other. We, with the money from the Natural History Society right now, we're getting set up to um, sequence another 200 some people. And we're gonna sequence a little differently this time in the past. We sequence just the what's called the coding sequences. So just the part of the all your DNA that codes for proteins. And that's a very small part of all your DNA. This time, because technology has advanced tremendously and the costs, importantly, have gone down tremendously, instead we're going to sequence um, all the genome. And in fact, because the cost has gone down enough, we're not just going to select the 50 some people, 60 people who are extreme, we're going to just sequence everybody. That, and so with this, with people who have Rett syndrome or other MECP2 mutations, we have about 200 samples. So we're going to sequence the entire genome of all of those samples um, to do the analysis that I'm talking about. But then also because that'll be available then as part of the biorepository. We'll know the full genetic makeup of the 200 people with Rett syndrome or MECP2 mutations in that biorepository, they'll already have been sequenced. So we're gearing, in fact, I was just working on that right before the call, scrolling through the data, figuring out that, maybe trying to make arrangements to um, start that, going, that pipeline happening. Fantastic. Sounds like, you know, this is work that could lead to um, other potential treatment avenues um, down the road, and um, so in by people volunteering to provide these samples um, and you doing the work, um, we could be advancing potential therapeutic avenues. Well, that that would definitely be the hope. I mean, we we know that from animal work that was done by Monica Justice, um, who's now in Toronto, but I had worked with her when she was in uh, Baylor when we were both at Baylor. Um, where they did what's called genetic screens in the mouse model of Rett syndrome, and they found uh, genetic changes in other genes that changed the severity of the mice. And so the, the concept is there that you can, there are other genes, and this is not, the concept is not surprising because we know that all these biological pathways, that's how they work. They, these are all systems, um, but they did find a number of things, and so that's actually, great for us um, from the human genetic side because now we have things that we already know might involve our pathways specific genes or other pathways so when we do the analysis we can use and build upon that information and knowledge that monica justice has done but also we also hope we can find new things excellent good and in talking about things that we have you know that you have been able to on um, through the natural history study. Um, Dr. Percy, can you bring up other ways that um, there have been positive outcomes from the natural history study? You know, so if someone were to say to you, what has my child's participation, how has that made a difference? Um, what, are, what are some of the outcomes that, that people can identify um, where their child's participation made a difference? 
Yeah, that is a great question that uh, probably the, those of us in our day-to-day -day activities don't think about. But I sat down, I I came up with 10, and I think there's 11th, and there are probably many others that uh, the other two could come up with. But first and foremost, I think over the time, uh, we've just improved clinical care. We've learned more about the disorder. Uh, understood it, and we actually have led to an Im improvement in care. Uh, we've also created a family, a network of families and clinicians across the country. Initially, during the first uh, 10 or so years of the study, uh, we the sites were all uh, on the East Coast or in, in Houston. But we did go to, to four sites across the country as travel clinics, and 40% of the enrollment was at these travel clinics, either in Oakland, Chicago, um, uh, Robert Wood Johnson in, uh, in New Jersey, and then a couple of sites in, in Florida. And uh, those were very valuable. And over the course of that, we developed expertise in, in these other centers. So now that we have 13 or 14 additional sites uh, across the country. Uh, we've established the exceptional longitudinal data uh, co which combine both parent input and caregiver input as well as clinician input. So you have both sides of the coin and it's very important to have both perspectives. Um, Why is it important to have both perspectives? Uh, well, I think that uh, if, if you look at it from the physician's point of view, what we see is only a snapshot in time. It's a really small portion of that child's life. Uh, on the other hand, what the parents see may be related to uh, the uh, mutation and the particular effects of it, but there could also be other uh, influences going on in the home, other children, other activities, um, and so, it's important to get the physician, the parent's perspective, which goes across 24 hours. We understand that as clinicians. We go home at night. The parents deal with it around the clock. Um, additionally, uh, uh, and I, I, I've sent this to you, and I think you have additional information, but uh, what I sent to you, we have nearly 50 peer-reviewed papers. I think maybe with the, uh, this one, we were closer to 50, uh, directly representing results of the study. Uh, we have nearly 20 other related papers and uh, at least 20 review papers. Uh, uh, that's a pretty uh, solid uh, bit of work over the past year. Um, we created specific documents that can help with uh, family with family with care, such as overnutrition, GI function, uh, scoliosis, survival, and ECGs. Um, we've increased uh, understanding of the genotype phenotype relationship, and um, more recently, although we haven't published this, uh, it's in. It's in process of, of being written. Uh, we have uh, done X chromosome and activation studies in girls with Rett syndrome to see if, if the differences in the amount of which gene is being affected, uh, is being expressed, either the normal gene or the uh, affected gene. Uh, and that should be very helpful. Uh, we've created uh, uh, a clinical trial readiness, uh, which Jeff can speak to much more eloquently than me, but uh, this is now available across the, the country with many, many sites. Uh, we're working to improve uh, and validate outcome markers, including, including updating or advancing the what was uh, established back in the 90s, the motor behavioral assessment score to improve that. Um, and we have uh, some uh, work in uh, that Jeff can talk about with that. We have clinical care guidelines that have been published uh, thanks to uh, the leadership of Tim Benke, and, but everybody really has been part of that. And I think we've also increased awareness among non-neurologists or other physicians across the country about 
Rett syndrome and Rett related disorders. So we hope that uh, that through education uh, and even in medical school or training programs, we are improving the access of uh, families uh, to appropriate care. Uh, this was brought out to me by an email I got from a, a mother or grandmother actually, whose uh, granddaughter is in India. And the amount of information that they have in India is, uh, is dwarfed by what we have in this country. Wow, well, thank you for, for providing that. You know, it sounds like what we've heard so far, um, you know, not only have you learned about the disease across um, the life spectrum in, in much more detail, um, you've been able to create guidelines uh, that can help uh, families, it can also help their local team since not everyone lives close to a rec clinic and they may be getting most of their care closer to home. Um, you've also um, been doing additional studies which will help um, with clinical trial readiness and you're publishing all this work. Um, you know, you guys have been busy over the last uh, 17 years to say the least. Um, we thank you for everything that you and all the natural history study um, teams have been able to put into this, as well as all the families um, that have been willing to contribute um, in making the visits regularly, as well as uh, donating samples or sitting for their evoked potential studies. Well, that's a key uh, point. We couldn't do anything without the families. Absolutely. They're, they are uh, the most critical part of, of this work. You know, and this natural history study funding from the National Institutes of Health will be wrapping up uh, this summer. And so the way that the natural history study is being done currently will be ending um, at the end of July. So can you speak to Jeff, if someone wanted to get involved over let's say the next six months until the natural history study ends, what do they need to do to be able to get involved? Well, I think they just uh, need to reach out to the sites. We are still in, enrolling people. Um, you know, there, there's been, because of COVID and the restrictions and the different sites, um, there are different levels of ability to do that. Some of the sites can um, see people in person, some cannot. We, we've adapted though so that we've changed the protocol and we actually uh, did that we had changed the regulatory aspects of protocol um, before COVID not realizing that it was advantageous to do so to allow you to do remote visits. There are some things that we cannot capture remotely but we can enroll people remotely. We did this actually specifically to try to enroll people more people, more of the boys who have MECP2 mutations and also the people who have um, MECP2 duplications um, and people who are just too severe or live too far away. I mean, that, that's really the reason we did this is to um, get more ability to enroll people who cannot, for all kinds of reasons, travel to one of the uh, 14 enrolling sites across the country. So we do have the capability of doing that and we'd love to, uh, we are very much encouraging people to do that. We're really focusing in the last six months though of trying to um, get people who had, who are already enrolled to get that, to see them again so we can have more of this longitudinal data. It's really important to have a lot of longitudinal data, time over time data. Um, and then we also are trying to encourage people who um, are underrepresented. We, we actually, like Alan said, our numbers are really pretty high for people who have typical Rett syndrome and have a typical type of mutation. mutation. Um, we'd love to get more information on people like boys who have MECP2 mutation. We'd love to get more people who have the Rett related disorders, CDKL5 and FOXG1. We'd love to get more people who have MECP2 duplication. We'd also like to get people who um, have a MECP2 mutation um, maybe but don't have Rett syndrome, right? Or who are very, very mildly affected. Um, these are people that we are very interested in seeing enrolled. Um, and especially as I was alluding to getting into the biobank. So, you know, we're very appreciative of all the people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and give blood. So 
uh, you know, I, I'll use my example, like Eric and Alan, it's easier to put on the EEGs because they're bald, but me, I have big veins. So, you know, you can get them my blood easily, but, um, but no, it's very, we're very grateful. So I think that's, that's probably the most important. Those are the things that we're really focusing on and we're really interested in doing. Just want to add uh, just to Alan um, comments about the, the successes and the progress that we've made. I mean, I think that he really highlighted it. I think one thing too is, you know, we, we have the, the clinical criteria for red syndrome that came out in 2010, and that was a consensus effort that we put together internationally. But key to that was that we actually were able to use the natural history study to show that it really, the consistency was there before. I mean, the kind of the way things were diagnosed, it didn't change what people's categories were. So that was really important. Um, you know, we've heard about this work from Eric and the biomarker developments and the biomarkers we're doing. And we recently just, you know, published a paper uh, outlining doing what's called psychometrics to evaluate and create um, outcome measures, right? And we are in the process of using this natural history study to refine and improve these outcome measures. So along with biomarkers, um, and so I'll just speak uh, the concept that Alan mentioned about clinical trial readiness, and we really focus, one of the things is having sites that can do it. And that's what, you know, the natural history say, just the infrastructure really it's sort of developed an infrastructure that there are places where people can go and people at those sites are experienced with Rett syndrome and they're experienced with um, doing clinical research. The other is um, having the sort of community who are engaged and engagement with the patient advocacy groups like redsyndrome.org. These are really important things. The other is to have things that we can measure, right? So we, we want to do a clinical trial. We have to measure an outcome. So we need things that are like outcome measures and biomarkers. And so that's one of the, these are the goals that we're really trying to shoot for. And I think we are now at the point of really, you know, getting to a point that we think we have good candidates for biomarkers. Biomarkers are a difficult thing to do and, and validate to a point that the FDA likes it, but we are moving forward in the way that we, I think we've set a good groundwork and we're really working to utilize what we've captured in this longitudinal data to have what we think would be outcome measures. And I think we're moving forward on that and we're really excited about those opportunities. Thanks so much, Jeff. So the work through the natural history study will hopefully improve uh, clinical trials down the road because if we have biomarkers and uh, better outcome measures, then it gives us the ability to tell a drug that's working to actually demonstrate uh, that it's working for uh, someone with Rett syndrome. So that is a really important, um, it's, a, it's something important to work towards. And it's great to hear that through this natural history study, um, you can be identifying both biomarkers and um, pathways to better outcome measures. Uh, you know, a question came in while you were talking about the natural history study, two different questions about enrollment. Um, so one is, if I enroll remotely, can a natural history study site work with my local physician to capture study data? So is that something that's possible? Alan, you so, want to take that? <laughs> no, you know, the natural history study as it's outlined now, we have to fill in certain amounts of information that are specific to the study. Uh, so we can certainly gather information from the local physician, but we would have to uh, also uh, analyze, uh, evaluate the data, evaluate the child, and make our own determinations. Uh, we rely on a lot of uh, historical information from physicians already, particularly growth data. They're, they're actually key to uh, making the uh, diagnosis. Okay, great. Um, so it sounds like they would still need to be in touch with um, one of the natural history study sites, uh, but some of the data is what you called historical data. So it's not data that you're collecting at that point, but it might be their growth data across the years that their home doctor um, is able to provide. So a similar question, someone asked if their uh, child with Rett syndrome um, is in a long-term facility, uh, but was previously in the study, is can they still participate? 
I see no reason why they couldn't. Um, Excellent. So if they been... oh, go one, ahead. One thing about uh, a remote visit is the uh, the examination that we can conduct is obviously limited. The neurologist has to put your their hands, his or her hands, on you to assess many things. So we can do much of it by observation. Uh, but we also need a good historian on the ground. So presumably there is a caregiver who is uh, regularly uh, attending the child or the family is still uh, active in, in seeing the child. And sure, it, it could easily be uh, accommodated. Uh, you can set up a Zoom visit uh, in a home. It, it's not specific to wherever the child or uh, the person's residence, uh, the family residence is, it's where the child is. Excellent. So I'm seeing a lot of interest in um, the questions about how to re-enroll or how to re-engage. So it sounds like they, you know, a family that's interested, whether they've been involved or not, should contact um, their closest natural history study site. They can find that um, either um, on clinicaltrials.gov uh, or we have a trial finder. So our RET Research Ready site um, and Paige can put the link in the chat. Um, through that, you can, ident you can find where the natural history study sites are. I and mean, if you've been involved before, it's likely best to recontact um, the, the site that you were already, your child was already seen in. But for those that haven't previously been enrolled, um, Dr. Newell had brought up several of the kind of key, key things that, they, that the natural history study uh, investigators are hoping to get more enrollment of um, some of the atypical um, Rett syndrome, boys, um, CDKL5, FOX3-1, MECP2 duplication, um, and those that have a MECP2 mutation but do not carry a diagnosis of RET. Um, so lots of additional studies in the future, hopefully. Um, hopefully we'll keep your next six months uh, exceptionally busy, either virtually um, through visits or uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some in-person visits as well so you can get your hands on those study participants and do your full exams. Uh, so I also want to know what's going to happen when the natural history study ends. Um, so Eric, can you speak to what work has been in place to ensure that the data that's been collected uh, since 2006 continues to be a resource? Sure. Um, you know, a couple things are going to happen with the data. So one, the NIH does require that the data be put into a publicly accessible database called dbGaP which um, academic, people from academics and others can uh, access the data through a process that um, this database has in place. But more importantly, working with um, you and RSO, we've set up a, a process for this data to go to, um, to a database that will live on um, and allow people to have access to it and see parts of the data and then allow um, interested parties who want access to the data to have access to it as well. So there's going to be more that we're you know, still working on with getting this data structured and out there so that people can access it and ideally have even a, a family uh, parent um, caregiver interface where they can look up aspects of their child compared to what has been collected in the natural history data over the years so that it becomes directly um, impactful for individuals to learn kind of where their child compares to others. But so those are the two main things, the through RSO, that the data is going to be available through, a, it's a company called Hive, but if you want to talk more about that, and then it is being placed in the NIH's dbGaP, so that the data will be out there for lots of people to access. And even though the study's ending, all of us who are involved in it are still eagerly analyzing the data. They've collected, you know, this is an incredible data set that's been collected over years and years. And those, you know, there's been tons of papers published, but there'll be more coming um, as we continue to dig deeper into it. Excellent. So it's good to hear about how the data um, will live on and can still continue to be used uh, by researchers um, so that we can continue to learn from it. As you said, 
you know, Dr. Percy had mentioned, I think, almost 100 papers that have been published, um, either directly from this or related to this work, uh, but much more that is yet to be published um, and yet to be learned from this. Uh, another question that, that people commonly ask is um, for uh, adults with Rett syndrome, when they parents feel like when their their child was younger, they heard all the time um, from their Rett team, um, but then kind of that that contact seemed to fade, or the frequency of the visits was less. Uh, are adults uh, with Rett syndrome still included in the natural history study? Absolutely. Uh, that, <laughs> Percy. Uh, absolutely. Um, so there are one point, uh, the three of us were trained as pediatricians, but uh, we spent a year of uh, adult in adult uh, medicine with uh, our neurology training. So we're very comfortable seeing uh, both children and adults. Um, and we, we enjoy seeing the adults uh, here, and I, I think most places try to see adults annually. Uh, we do not necessarily collect the data annually because we think, think things are more stable after 20 or 30 years of age. And so we may collect the data every other year, but we still plan to see uh, individuals annually to be certain that everything is going uh, appropriately. And I know there's another question down the line that was, uh, can adults enroll? And certainly, I think that's these are... Oh, this is one of the groups that uh, we would like to see our adults who have never been involved. Uh, it is likely that uh, those who live longer perhaps either have received better overall care or have better overall health or perhaps have milder uh, involvement with their specific gene. And so it would be very important to uh, have um, that group of individuals. So there's no barricade to anyone entering the study. Great. So even though you introduced yourselves as a child neurologist or you might work at uh, children's hospitals or pediatric centers, uh, you can still continue to see adults with Rett syndrome, even as new patients, not just because you saw them when they were technically a child and now are adult. Um, so that's good to hear for all all those caretakers of, of adults with Rett syndrome. I think many children's hospitals do not in, in, um, admit adults, but uh, they, in most cases, allow uh, an outpatient visit to occur in an adult, in a children's setting. Yeah, that is true here at uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia. We cannot admit anyone over the age of 21, but that we're happy to continue to see people in consultation and, and in conjunction with a, you know, an internal medicine or a, a family practice doctor to continue their care, um, even as um, past that uh, age of childhood. Excellent. And there was a question that came in um, on both spectrums of the age. Um, how young can an individual be to enroll? And what is the age of your oldest individual um, that you, you know, generally that you have enrolled in the study? We uh, enrolled a woman who was 66 at the time of enrollment, and I, she passed away of something unrelated really to Rett syndrome. She had uh, uh, diabetes and it was um, not properly, uh, I think, addressed, and uh, she succumbed subsequently but, uh, before she was 70. I think 68 or 69. Um, and currently we have uh, two or three individuals in their 50s, and I think Dan Glaze has a number of individuals in their 50s as well. I don't know about uh, Jeff or Eric specifically. Great, but it sounds like definitely individuals in their 50s and 60s um, continue to be seen at your clinics. How about little ones? How young are you able to enroll a patient? And we can enroll them as uh, soon as uh, someone has the clue uh, to uh, 
uh, do the test. Now, we did enroll a girl in one of the travel clinics, a uh, young girl, uh, seven months of age, when she had her gene mutation. It turned out that uh, that mutation was probably um, diagnosed inaccurately, and and unfortunately, we lost contact with that girl. But uh, uh, we have seen now individuals uh, who are uh, in the uh, first half of their second year of life. So while the average age is around two and a half, roughly, of all those that, uh, enrolled, uh, we have seen many more in re more recently uh, in less than two years of age. And that's beginning to become a more common thing as genetic testing becomes more widely available and people send genetic testing really early before a, cl a particular clinical picture emerges that we're getting early, younger and younger diagnoses. Now, the, the large screens or a whole uh, exome testing is uh, really the cause of that, I think. Uh, and that's good, not a, yeah. not a bad thing. Yeah, so you know, it sounds like participation is really limited by the age that someone is actually identified as having Rett syndrome. Um, and now you're seeing more individuals who are getting genetic testing, um, some at even younger ages, um, whether it's because of it was in a panel or larger uh, screens that are resulting in, in a diagnosis at these young ages. That's particularly Great. true for uh, CDKL5, where uh, the individuals may have uh, severe seizures during uh, early infancy, and they get a, a, gen a seizure panel, and the diagnosis pops up. So we've seen uh, uh, a girl, uh, I think, five months of age. Okay. Good. That's helpful for, for everyone to understand the, the age of inclusion. So open to any age, really, um, just needs a, a diagnosis of RET or RET related, um, as young or as old as they may be. Uh, so we, we touched on this briefly. Um, Eric, you mentioned that the data was available um, either through dbGaP or now through RETSyndrome.org as well. If a researcher wanted to, to use the data, is that something that they can access? So yes, um, for dbGaP, the, the NIH program has rules on how to apply to access the data. Um, the data goes into a period of embargo um, before it gets open to people, but I believe that we've talked about just getting that done as fast as possible so that it's out there for pe people. And then for the, the RSO database, um, there'll be a way, a mechanism by which individuals can ask to see the data, and there'll be a data governance system that allows people to request the data, and that we then would provide the data for them if it's appropriate uh, for them to use it. And in, in most cases, it will be appropriate, but we just want to make sure people aren't randomly taking the data for no reason that we can tell. Great. And when data is shared, uh, do you provide the participants' name, date of birth, their home address? Is all that information given to researchers that want to look at the data? No, it's not. So we um, provide de-identified data. So the data that gets shared uh, is stripped of all the information that can identify um, the individuals back to whom they are. So all the important clinical information is shared, but there's no identifier. So there's no risk um, to the families in us sharing this data for people. It's only going to help move the science and the potential clinical treatments uh, forward. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Marsh, you mentioned um, treatments. Dr. Newell, can you touch on, we've touched on it very briefly, but how does a natural history study help towards finding a treatment for a disorder such as Rett syndrome? Yeah, I can talk about it. I'm going to have to jump off in just a little bit um, because I have another call in a second. But, um, you know, I think we sort of alluded to this a couple different ways uh, as we've been talking. One is that it just, you know, should optimally create what we call clinical trial readiness. So it should set the stage to be able to do an effective 
uh, clinical trial because you have the people who can do it, the sites that can do it. You develop things that would be outcome measures that you're measuring. You've established that those measures are meaningful um, and know what the degree of change is. You have biomarkers that can do it. The other is, um, like I said, sometimes you know the, the distinction between something being a biomarker versus actually providing insight into what the cause of the disease is is not just clear. On one hand, you're doing a biomarker, but if we start digging in and looking at the the evoked potential work that Eric said, if we can understand, you know, why you might have certain responses, that might provide insight into what's going on in the brain that might give you ideas on how you might approach treating it. Similar with the metabolic features. Some of the metabolic features that we identified look like they have are indicating of having what's called oxidative stress or mitochondrial dysfunction. And so that starts becoming an insight into the underlying disease process that you might be able to target. And the third is exactly what I was saying before about trying to find genetic modifiers, because that might provide an insight into different approaches to the therapies. So all of these things, I think, intertwine and provide um, hopefully the, the basis and the foundation for us to do effective clinical trials and hopefully with new approaches. Excellent, thank you. Um, you know, so redsyndrome.org has recognized through close collaboration um, with the clinicians and the researchers um, in Rett syndrome, as well as through interactions um, with regulatory agencies and pharmaceutical companies that this body of work really is, is critical um, for both improving the clinical care as well as that drug development process. And for this reason, RedSyndrome.org has been working with uh, you as well as other members of our medical advisory board to design a future data collection effort that will replace the natural history study. Um, and so this will be the RET Clinical Disease Registry. Um, Eric, can you touch on some of the goals of this new registry that we've been working on? Sure. So, you know, one of the goals is you know, we have a lot of momentum. Uh, in the, the, the clinical research that uh, Dr. Percy started uh, a few years ago, and that is will continue uh, for allow us to collect this data, which is very rich data. There's still a lot to, you know, we've learned an awful lot about Rett syndrome, but there still are uh, things to learn clinically about, um, as Jeff was mentioning, subpopulations or more rare populations within Rett. So this will allow us to continue to collect this rich kind of clinical data set that we've been collecting over the years. That will also help in um, uh, focusing some of these outcome measures and potentially being able to, to, um, to get to a point where these outcome measures are, are tighter and are more um, will work better for any potential clinical trials. One of the things that we've talked about for this database is the ability to do what we would call pragmatic trials, where if people start to use similar, apply similar clinical um, pathways to treating um, uh, their patients with Rett syndrome, that we could track how effective things are. You know, um, all of us, if uh, one of our uh, family says their daughter's not sleeping, you know, Dr. Percy might say, try, melatonin and I would say try clonidine and, and Dr. Newell will say try trazodone and I'm just making that up. I have no idea what they would say. But there are a lot of different options of what someone could say to try to say how to improve sleep in RET. And we don't have great data on what really works for certain things. So this would be a way to be able to collect data in a standardized fashion to allow us without doing a formal clinical trial to get more insight into um, our clinical practice and improve our clinical practice. Um, so those are two of the kind of the big uh, aspects of continuing to collect this uh, data moving forward. Um, anyone else have thoughts about that? No, that was great. And and Jeff, if I could ask you, I know you said you're going to have to jump off soon, but can you briefly mention how this data collection effort is different from the natural history study? Well, the the difference is that it is really um, what we call real world data. It's, it's, not, it's collected in a, in a, it's not collected as part of a, a research study. It is research and we will extract the data, 
but instead of asking people to come in to a clinical research center for just to see, just to do a natural history study visit with very specific procedures and processes and activities that are related to the research, instead this is um, you're just going to see the doctor and they're just capture they're just collecting the information that they need to document that is part of their normal clinical care. What it is, is on the back end, it's, it's structured so we can extract it and analyze it systematically. So that's the difference, really. I think that you know the goal of, of these efforts is to reduce the barrier to participation, both for the participants, the people with Rett syndrome and their families, as well as for the doctors, because it shouldn't be any different than your normal clinical care. Everything should just be, you come in to see the doctor, they're asking you what's wrong. They're recording it like we all do. I know doctors now, we just sit there and look at our computers all the time. So they'll just do what they always do. Um, and the only difference is that we will, we will be able, we will, you'll, we'll have permission from the participants um, to take that data out of the medical record and warehouse it together without that information about their names, their addresses, it's, it's called de-identified. So that's the fundamental difference. Hopefully it'll be, easier um, for everybody involved. You know, the, there's pluses and minuses to this level of approach. The ease is the big is the big advantage. The disadvantage is that you, you're you gonna sacrifice um, the sort of systematic and consistency of the data in, in favor of the ease. But I think that, you know, especially given the 17 year history, the large number of people who have been collected very systematically, I think we're at a point now where more broad data that may not be as precise is more important than highly, highly precise, complicated, specific things that take two hours to come to a special visit. Right now we're at, we're at a different point and I think this real world data will be much more, will be valuable moving forward. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff, for, for explaining some of that. Um, and Alan, if, if an interested family wants to have their son or their daughter or family member included in this new data collection, how does that happen? Well, they have to reach out to somebody or have asked their physician to reach out to somebody. Uh, if they happen to know the site, uh, they can uh, reach out directly. Um, I field emails all the time or calls and I think perhaps uh, Eric and Jeff do too. But if a, a family is at uh, a loss is exactly how to proceed, I think probably uh, you already mentioned us one of them and that is to contact uh, redcenter.org and you have a way to, uh, to tell the family where is the closest site uh, that you could go and, and how to contact that site. And uh, uh, I think uh, it is really straightforward. It is not hard. Uh, we're here and, and as long as we're here, I, we, we'll be uh, willing to take calls and see people. And Dr. Percy, why don't you call individuals and tell them to come back in? Why do we have to reach out as, as family members? Is that how it works? Well, um, if I knew everybody, I certainly would uh, send a, a, an email, blanket email. Uh, I'm not on Twitter, so I can't, uh, uh, <laughs> I can't communicate. You got like banned this. again, Alan? You got banned again? Oh my yes, God. Have <laughs> something. Too soon. Too soon? Okay, sorry. But, but I do uh, think that's a question that people have. They say, well, I've been to the clinic in the past. Why aren't they reaching out to me to schedule me for an appointment? But what I'm hearing here is really, it's up to the families to schedule their annual visits. Um, well, and actually, we we have we keep a log and we contact people uh, r routinely. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people move, they change their emails, they change their phones, and we lose contact in that way. And, and we don't know this is happening. Uh, so we need to hear from families if if they're having problems and if they think uh, we're ignoring them uh, they can uh, yell at us and say why haven't you called me <laughs> yeah so reach back out whether it's you know currently for the natural history study but then after july 31st um, for the new data collection you can continue to reach out through those natural history study uh sites and, and certainly you could uh contact uh, children's of alabama 
Um, you can contact uh, the child neurology office at, uh, at UAB. We can be reached. <laughs> Great, and we, we do have all the, the numbers listed on the, the trial finder as well as the retinum.org um, clinic website. Eric, if someone includes their data in this registry, uh, does that affect their ability to participate in a clinical trial? Um, so the answer to that should be no. Uh, you know, generally, registry natural history data collection does not exclude you from a clinical trial. Most clinical trials do exclude you from being in another clinical trial at the same time. Um, but we would expect and hope that this would not preclude you from being within any other trial. And you know, when trials are being discussed, we could all ensure that this would not, you know, make the company aware of what's going on and prevent it from being part of a, uh, from being an exclusion from being in a clinical trial. And Jeff, if someone comes for a visit after July 31, um, and they agree to have their data entered um, into this new um, RET clinical disease registry, how do they pay for it? Uh, well, there should be no payment um, from the, there's, this should not be requiring payment from anybody who participates in uh, the trial. You know, just like the natural history study, um, we do not require any payments, of course, from the participants. We also have not been providing any funds to the participants, so we're very grateful to all the families who have participated without any funding. I um, mean, we don't anticipate there being any funds flowing to the participants either, because this is just should be a normal clinic visit. You should be coming to see your doctor when you need to see your doctor, because that's the routine of care or you have a problem. So there should be really no money transactions that occur. So then if it's a regular clinic visit, it should get billed through insurance um, like their pediatrician or internist does. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. This should just be because, again, there should be nothing that is going on during that visit that is not just part of routine clinical care. But just to, to, to highlight Dominic's point, it's you know make sure that you have your insurance company will pay for your visit and you're not going to be stuck with an out-of-pocket cost for coming. Um, you know, it's. Rules are constantly changing and they will probably continue to change, but just make sure you have all prior authorizations or insurance approvals that you would need to see um, the neurologist who's part of uh, the, not the registry, the right registry. Well, and I think that that's, that's a good point about what's the difference between the current natural history study and what things will look like in the future is that current natural history study, there is, oh, you, you need to come back in a year or two years or four years, depending on your age. Um, in this, you don't come back because of the study. You come back because you have clinical, you come back for clinical care. Now that might be that your clinic sees you every year when you're stable. It may be that you have bad epilepsy and you've got to go see Dr. Marsh every month because he's modifying his medicines. It doesn't matter, you know, that we we're, that's what it means by real world naturalistic data. We're, ca we're just extracting what happened during your normal clinic visit at whatever pace it was supposed to happen by how your clinician thought it should happen. Thank you for the clarification, because that can seem confusing, you know, especially for families that have been participating in the natural history study. Um, and maybe they travel across several states. Maybe they even jump over a different um, RET clinic um, on their way to what had been the natural history study site. Um, and so that's something that, as Dr. Marsh pointed out, would you'd have to, of course, check with your insurance provider, um, just like you do for any other um, doctor visit before you go. Um, and as Dr. Newell said, may be more frequent than once a year um, because this is just your doctor providing clinical care. Good, well, we are getting close to time. Um, you know, so just a few more questions. Um, are there research studies that are conducted that are not drug trials, not natural history study, that, that are conducted at sites that are considered Rett syndrome clinics? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there are. I think uh, you all can talk about different things. But for example, we're doing a small um, wearables study uh, with a special watch for just a very small um, kind of uh, population just to see um, as a kind of a proof of concept little study. And so that if, you know, so for some of our patients, we'll be asking them to participate in this um, small study. And, you know, I think there are different sites that are doing research like this. I don't know if you two want to also comment. I know that uh, a study like this is going on in Greenwood, and uh, we might participate with them. And I, I think Jeff has an additional study that's starting up. Yeah, yeah, and Sar Peters has done work funded by RedSyndrome.org on similar kind of things with the wearable devices, um, you know, and we're, we're starting to do a validation study on this new outcome measure that came from the, the natural history study. Um, and furthermore, there are sites that have been do, that do clinical research and, and various things that haven't even been part of the natural history study so far, right? And we would love to in, keep those people, get those people involved in the newer version when it's uh, different kind of things. Places like Kennedy Krieger uh, Institute and um, Sasha Duchik at uh, Einstein. So, I mean, I think that's one of the great advantages of the way the we're going to be migrating this is that it really will provide a lot more opportunity for other sites to be to participate because it's really the barrier is going to the a big part of the barrier is just going to be willingness to participate and do the do be consistent in how you record your clinical information. Yeah. I'm sorry, I do need to jump off. I'm sorry, on my calendar it said one to two. Sorry about that, Jeff. <laughs> That's okay. But thank I have, you so I have, much I have for a call at 30, so thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, Dr. Newell. Um, so we are getting to the end, um, the last few minutes. Um, you know, and and I think it's 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 important for people to know. So thank you for bringing up that individual clinics may have additional research studies. So for those that want to participate in research, that's not a drug trial. Um, you can always ask at your clinic visit, are there other research studies that are going on um, that you may be able to participate in? Um, I also wanted to, as we wrap up this portion, wanted to bring up that there is a RET Global Registry that is currently being launched um, by the RET Syndrome Research Trust. And so I was wondering if you could talk about how um, these efforts are different um, from the the clinical disease registry that we've been talking about here so yeah the so the rsrt uh um platform what they're trying to do is going to be a family caregiver uh, oriented platform where the data is collected directly from the families they'll ask questions they'll have surveys or forms that get filled out about how your child's doing and it will you know, once a year or, or a varying frequency, depending on what the questions are, they're going to ask one to do. And there's no physician or researcher intermediary. It's just um, a platform that is being set up for people to enter this data so the data can be collected. Um, the RSO sponsored program is physician collected data, right? So there's a, the physicians are asking questions and entering the data, where that, which means that there's some level of interpretation or uh, input that the physician has in the quality of that data uh, or in the data that's input. So though we might be asking, there's two similar things might be uh, acquired, they're coming from different points of view, one directly from the family and the other which has the physician filter on it. And there's pros and cons of both. And ideally, um, that we're working hard to trying to synchronize these data sets so that we there's a share we know who's in each one so that ultimately um, a clinical researcher such as Dr. Percy could say, hey, I want to see how these things compare. You told your physician that your sleep is good, but then you filled out this form and said the sleep was bad. How the you know how why is that and why does that come about? And a lot can be learned if these sources of data 
are synchronized. And the, the existing natural history studies sort of did that in itself, right? There were surveys you had to fill out, which you just fill out. Yes, the research coordinator might have helped you fill it out or ask, uh, help you answer some questions, but was filled out by the parent. And then there was the physician acquired aspect of it. And so this is sort of just expanding that, but in two different halves. And there, there will hopefully, and working hard at making sure there's communication between the two halves to allow um, the data to, to get the maximal use of the data. In addition, RSRT is doing this program with, I believe it's All Stripes is the company. It could be Citizen, I can't remember offhand. Citizen. It's Citizen, sure. where that Citizen is a private company that uh, asks you for access to their, they get your your all of your medical records for you, and then they'll extract information from the medical records to develop a natural history type of protocol. And from a clinical researcher point of view, having all these different things going on is interesting to see what is consistent and what is different and what insights can be gained from these different approaches. Um, I personally think that probably all three being done um, together will be the, the most powerful and that each by themselves has their limitations that the other ones will overcome. So, you know, th that is, it is different, um, but we're hopefully there'll be some synchronization going on to maximize the potential of all the data that's being collected. Great. And can, Dr. Percy, can you talk to, would there be any way um, to connect someone who was a participant in the natural history study and their future participation in um, the new disease registry we've been talking about. Are there any identifiers that can be used um, to help collect that data more longitudinally? <laughs> uh, we will have to be very careful to be certain that the identifiers are, that uh, we use now are similar or identical to the ones going forward. Uh, we use an identifier, uh, and, and there are many ways to do this, but we use a platform now uh, set up by the NIMH, and I think we can use a similar platform or same platform going forward. Uh, but uh, the point you raise, we do not want any confusion between, um, I'll use Jane as an example, and, and our study and Jane in the new study. Um, you want to have the, the same uh, data being merged uh, and being merged accurately. Absolutely. Uh, we are working on that, but I don't think we have that firmly uh, nailed down yet. One point I would make, uh, we are currently are collecting an interval history, and uh, that is going to be modified in some extent, and we're currently having that analyzed by a private uh, a group, uh, and that will be information that will the family will be asked to uh, complete, and that will go into each of or many of these visits. I don't think if they're seen monthly, they'll be doing it monthly, but certainly at least annually. And uh, of course, the historical information will be part that can be you know, filled out by the family as well. So uh, it will be a quite different, but I think quite efficient way to. Uh, continue the, the study going forward. Great, so just to clarify, you're, you're talking about, um, so this new re disease registry that we're building um, with your input and the medical advisory board's input. Um, Dr. Marsh had mentioned how it's clinician inputted data, uh, but you're saying there still will be a component uh, that the families complete through what had been called the interval history form in the natural history study, as well as the historical information that's uh, maybe provided during the visit. So there is still a component um, that the right. families for this new registry that um, will be launching in August after the natural history study is done. Great. We certainly hope so. <laughs> well, you guys have provided a tremendous amount of information um, for everyone to absorb. There have been questions flying in, most of which we weren't able to get to um, in order to keep this moving. So we will address those offline. Um, so I want to thank you all for, for being here. You know, um, and Paige, I'm going to hand it back over to you to close up. Um, but before I do, 
again, thank you to all of the researchers that really have made this natural history study um, such a wealth of information that, that will change, has changed, not only the clinical care um, that those of us who have children with RET receive, as well as um, the drug development process and the prospect of having um, well-designed clinical trials that show if a drug works um, that it actually does. So thank you for all your dedication, as well as the dedication of uh, the thousands of families that have for years uh, participated and hopefully will continue to participate in this important uh, research effort. Thank you. Yeah.